equivalent to five times the United Kingdom was lost in just 13 years as wilderness. Um, between the period of 2000 and 2013. And very quickly, you can see uh, in that map, uh, lots and lots of different habitats across the world. And anything that's red uh, is badly affected by human beings and anything that's dark green um, is pretty much near and natural. Um, and what you can obviously see is the United Kingdom is looking, I mean, there's not a great deal of detail there, but you can kind of imagine that the United Kingdom is pretty red. We're actually 183 out of 196 countries uh, in terms of uh, the league table of intactness. We're really right down at the bottom of it. Now, why does that matter at a local level when this is a global picture? Well, it matters because we've got no, no wilderness um, and this. Uh, another report that came out in the last uh, uh, wee while, uh, so this is actually a journal article I think from 2019, but um, uh, also fairly recent work, uh, is a clear indication that nature uh, keeps us alive, as Bruce was saying. Um, the ecosystem goods and services that nature provides us are the simple services that mean we can exist. And this report, uh, a nature report, suggests that wilderness areas halve the extinction risk of terrestrial biodiversity. And that's important because what that means is nature reserves are not enough. Um, we can't rely on nature reserves to provide the nature that keeps us alive. And partly because those nature reserves are islands, partly because they're manufactured or we manufacture them or we manage them and, and they sit as islands and we need to create a wilder landscape for those organisms to avoid the extinction risk because we're probably entering the sixth great extinction period uh, of the, on the planet. So uh, again, you know, it's kind of some bad news, but some good news too, um, because it gives us an indication of what we need to do. And obviously what we saw here this week was this fantastic stuff about these, these governments coming together. And the brilliant bit about um, this, uh, this, this pledge from the government um, that Boris Johnson promises to protect 30% of the United Kingdom's land by 2030. Now, whether or not um, that 30% is a real 30% is another question. Um, in, in a wildlife sense, you might have seen some great press releases from Craig Bennett, uh, the Wildlife Trust C uh, CEO, um, saying that actually you know, th these are paper numbers based around national parks and not really about wilderness. And the Wildlife Trust launched a, a campaign on Monday, um, you can see there at the bottom, launching a £30 million appeal to kickstart nature's recovery across 30% of land and sea by 2030. And that's the really exciting thing that we need to, as a journey, uh, you and me and the Wildlife Trust, we need to embark on. Um, let's, let's aim for 30% wilderness uh, in some way, shape or form, or rewilding rather than wilderness. We'll not get wilderness in Leicestershire and Rutland, but anything that's wilder, uh, let's make every 30% of Leicestershire and Rutland wilder uh, by 2030 in any way, shape or form. Um, and that's the really key, key journey that we need to be on over the next 10 years. And I want to give you an idea of how we might achieve that. Um, because we really do live in exciting times, don't we? And I don't know how many of you have read the fantastic book by Isabella Tree called uh, Wilding, looking at uh, expl explaining um, what uh, she and Charlie Borrell have done at uh, Nep, uh, Nep Castle Estate. Uh, and some really exciting news this week, uh, sorry, this year, uh, about the first wild stork chicks to emerge um, at, uh, at Nep Castle after a few years of uh, gentle reintroductions and indeed natural colonization to a degree. Um, so there's, there's a really exciting aspect here that if we give nature a chance, then nature will, will, uh, will take take course and, uh, and, and that we can be successful. Um, and we can really look forward to some really exciting things happening. And the really important thing is there are loads of these little things that are happening all across the United Kingdom. And let's see if we can make some of these happen in Leicestershire and Rutland too, uh, in appropriate ways, of course. We don't want to scare people. We want to take people on this journey. Um, and, uh, and that's what we'll be aiming to do. So the following is not actually trust policy per se, it's more personal opinion, but I'm gonna you know, kind of talk about some of the great stuff as I say about what the trust is doing. 
And I want to give you other examples of how we can make this happen, um, actually, and very quickly and on a big scale. So it doesn't have to be small pockets, but every little helps. Um, but we can also achieve great things uh, together. And uh, this is the Carafran project up in the borders of Scotland with one of my one of my ex uh, university lecturers uh, as a retirement project worked with uh, his local uh, friends and community through tree planting and natural regeneration, they rewilded uh, Carafran um, and, uh, and, and created, a, as you can see, I hope, a very, very different landscape, a wildlife rich landscape, a more natural landscape. Um, and let's see where we can do that here in Leicestershire and Rutland, building on what we've got already. Um, you know, in a big scale, because uh, that's the really important thing, I think, you know, kind of letting nature, uh, letting nature take its course and working with it. Um, and another example um, is uh, a conservation mantra, which uh, has been kicking around in the conservation world, and that's build it and they will come. And this is from my, uh, actually from this, this is from my home ground. Uh, I come from Spalding not too, too far away. And uh, Willow Tree Fen is only f four or five miles from my home. And uh, just brilliant news this year that, uh, that, that a chick, uh, a crane, crane chick uh, was, uh, was raised at Willow Tree Fen. So we can do it. Um, and the important thing will be to, to create the opportunities for nature to do that in, in Leicestershire and Rutland. Um, and, and we'll be looking to work with landowners and we'll be looking to work with everybody individually to see what exciting things we can, we can create spaces for in Leicestershire and Rutland. And I want to give you some examples of that um, as well. So um, there's a starting point here, which is really, really important if we think about this 30 by 30. Because what we, we, you know, we need a step change. Uh, and I really, really mean that we need to, uh, by scales of magnitude, we need to change the game here. So if we look at Leicestershire and Rutland, we're looking at something like uh, two million, two and a half million hectares, 2,542 2, square kilometres. Um, if we look at the triple SIs, the protected, designated, nationally protected sites, um, we're only looking at 5,000 hectares, um, which is about one, one and a half percent of Leicestershire, two percent of Leicestershire and Rutland. Um, and actually only about a quarter of those triple SIs are actually in favourable condition. Um, so that favorable condition means that they're actually really, really delivering wildlife. The, many of the others are getting there. It's just that they're not actually really in favorable condition. So we're actually not looking at a great deal of uh, Leicestershire countryside. And obviously we need to add to that all the farmland and the great stuff that people are doing already. But the point is we're nowhere near 30%. Uh, in Leicestershire and Rutland. If we add uh, those nature reserves which are not triple SIs, then we add an extra 278 hectares. Now each of our nature reserves on average is about 35 hectares, 35 football pitches. So what that means is by 2030, if we're to have 30% of Leicestershire and Rutland in a better place for wildlife, then we need something, well we need another 75,000 hectares, um, we, at least. Um, so that's probably another 2,000 nature reserves in some way, shape or form. Not just wildlife trust nature reserves, wouldn't it be brilliant if we had 2,000 nature, wildlife trust nature reserves, um, or indeed one nature reserve that large, um, but also, you know, private nature reserves, people doing great stuff for wildlife, um, whether it's golf courses or industrial estates or whatever. Um, and that's the target. Uh, let's let's set a target here of 70,000 hectares which are doing better for wildlife by the end of uh, by the end of this decade. So I want you to remember that number, okay? Because I know these numbers here are a little bit out of date. They're numbers from the Biodiversity Action Plan from 2016. We're actually only looking at probably less now, 200 hectares of calcareous grassland. Um, only 28 hectares of triple SI, 500 hectares of acid grassland. You can see the numbers there, tiny, tiny amounts. And that's that's really, really important. Um, and one of the critical things here is that over the last 25 years, there's been a significant change in the types of habitats. So across the United Kingdom, we've seen an increase in woodland and we need to do, see more of that, obviously for climate change purposes. We've seen an increase in urban areas and we've seen a reduction in arable land 
and a significant reduction in grassland. So there are some really important changes afoot that we need to both work with and work against. Because if we're not careful, we'll lose things like the fox moth, um, the violet click beetle, uh, and the pincushion moss, um, and lots of other species too. So we need to create these spaces, um, both in a habitat context, uh, in an area context, and for these species which obviously don't just sit in nature reserves, they live and breathe and move across the countryside. And one of the visions I want to put in front of you is you probably all remember these stories about red squirrels post ice age being able to run from tree to tree or hop or jump or whatever, you know, kind of from tree to tree uh, in a post ice age uh, woodland as it colonized the landscape. Well, it probably never did actually, um, if you kind of subscribe to Franz Vera's ideas. Um, but wouldn't it be brilliant if what we could do is create corridors where butterflies and hares um, can move through the landscape from one side of the county to another um, without having to cross roads, big roads, um, without having to run the gauntlet of uh, major urban areas um, and wildlife free farmland or whatever, you know, and let's let's look at these visions uh, and make these things happen for the future of these species. So um, one of the, what the, the, the mantra really uh, from the Lawton report is that we you know, kind of we need to create a, a landscape with um, more uh, more sites, many many more sites. We need to make them bigger. We need to make them better, better habitats, better habitat quality. Um, we need to make them more connected. Um, and not only that, I'll throw in this other one that we need to make them messier too. Um, you know, let's 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 do away with this. Everything needs to be clean and tidy because that's not so good for wildlife. Um, and what you can see there is across the top uh, a quick indication of the the, the landscape impacts. This was a fragmentation of ha um, heathlands in Dorset, but you know the story. It's the same picture in Leicestershire and Rutland with uh, our woodlands and our grasslands. And let's see how much of that we can get back um, in the next 10 years. Let's be really, really ambitious and, uh, and connect. You can see on the right hand side, the bottom right hand side there, a, a bit of a picture of uh, some of the, the, the different habitats. Um, the darker green is generally a reflection of woodland and grassland uh, in, in Leicestershire particularly. Um, and let's, let's start connecting and, uh, those green patches and, and making them bigger uh, and adding more to them using the, the Lawton vision, which is the middle picture there of, uh, of corridors and, and stepping stones. And, and that's what we're doing as a wildlife trust, looking to purchase, looking to acquire, looking to manage, looking to influence, working with landowners. Um, and there's some great stuff going on with, uh, pers with private corridor clubs, um, private nature reserves, which all add to the mix, all undoing the loss and fragmentation, which has been happening over the last 200 years. Um, and hopefully, you know, we can, we can create this wilder landscape uh, for the, from the perspective of wildlife being, uh, being wilder within that landscape. So what can we look forward to and what are we doing? Well, let's look forward to some wilder woodlands and parkland. And here are some ideas of things, some things that have been going on um, uh, you know, in, in the landscape to give us an, uh, you know, some hope that we can do some of these things. And I'm not saying this, these are things I don't want to scare people um, you know, that, that with saying that actually this is what we need to do. Um, but you can see there's uh, European bison have been introduced into a Kent woodland, for example. Um, we know that wild boar exist in, in, across m many parts of the southwest uh, of England. So, uh, you know, these major eco uh, ecological engineers, um, but also micro ones, you know, it's kind of the fungi um, and the beetles, things like the violet click beetle. Um, let's have some woodlands which are full of birdsong in the spring, and crisp autumn leaves uh, and uh, fungi, uh, the decomposers turning over the soil. Um, these woodlands which are alive with natural processes. And, and we're doing that with our nature reserves where we're trying to both allow natural processes to occur, not being so worried about trees being blown over, obviously other than for safety reasons, um, but also thinking about 
about how do we create these natural processes and enable them or replicate them um, because all that's important. So, um, you know, you can see a picture there of lawned park wood, the same as my background, um, where, you know, we've kind of removed some of the non-natives in the lawned park woodlands um, and we're allowing natural processes to occur and, you know, young trees and very, very old trees. And what we're seeing is things like not necessarily unless you're in Rutland, but, you know, kind of pine martens are returning to the landscape naturally. And much of what we can look forward to is natural return. We don't have to reintroduce species. If we allow them, allow them to come, then they will come naturally. Beavers will move across the landscape. We know that from Scotland um, as an example. Um, so who knows, by 2040, 2050, beavers could be pretty much natural across much of England. Um, if we just let them do that. And we've already seen this year kind of an, a, a really interesting, exciting increase in the number and possibly spread of things like uh, the purple emperor uh, as a butterfly. Um, and so, you know, Uta has been doing great work in the Charnwood Forest, along with Neil, um, in terms of managing the woodlands, just working with lit, the, the landowners. Um, and obviously the National Forest Company doing great stuff too, um, to look at increasing the amount of trees that are planted, obviously planting trees in the right place, um, and also enabling natural regeneration, because that's uh, allowing nature to do what it needs to do is, is just as important in that kind of context. Um, so let's, 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 let's look forward to seeing some much bigger woodlands um, and, uh, and, and doubling the amount of woodland um, uh, across that landscape. And I apologize, I'm gonna to have to go quickly because obviously I've only got kind of 40, 45 minutes to talk a very, very big picture. Um, but I want, I want us to be positive and, and really excited about, you know, with the tree strategy, for example, we've got a really, really important opportunity um, to creatively create woodlands where, where they're in the right places. Oh Lordy, sorry, I don't, um, I don't know what's happened there. I hope you can't, I don't know whether you can see that. Um, it's because my presentation is uh, hyperlinked. Um, let's have a look at some wilder farmlands. Um, so farmlands which are rich with food and feeling, you know, they're not just kind of monocultures of oilseed rape or, or grassland. And I know there are some cracking farmers out there, you know, kind of creating cow landscapes with cows and curlews and carbon, storing carbon in the soils. And some of the research I was work, in, involved with at uh, my previous uh, university re showed that actually hedgehogs have declined in the farmland landscape. So let's look forward to a landscape where we've got turtle doves, um, you know, and who knows, we, you know, that there may be, um, turtle doves might naturally recolonize. Maybe we can go through encouraging farmers as a farmer cluster to just like at Nep Castle, creating the kind of landscape where uh, turtle doves can be a part of that landscape. So if we can find a way of using the new agriculture bill to pay farmers for stewardship and life, pollinator banks, pollinator margins, wildflower margins, wilder hedgerows, plenty of scrub, these are the sorts of messages that we can all take forward. Um, in terms of yellow hammers and white throats and grasslands rich with orchids and, and kind of using the experiences of uh, the cattle that we got at Charnwood. Uh, and Cossington Meadows and the great stuff that John Bristow has been doing in kind of Cribs Meadows and Mary's Meadows and, and places like that, you know, looking forward to kind of boxing hares and lapwings um, and bigger meadows and wilder meadows. And, you know, really important habitats such as the limestone grasslands of, uh, of the east of uh, Leicestershire and Rutland and all those roadside verges. You know, I talked about these corridors. Let's get these verges um, extended and connected so that we can, when, you know, as we're, let's say, driving, who knows whether we'll be driving in 10 years time. But imagine that we, you know, do travel across the landscape. And we've been trying to work, you know, we've been working with the county councils. Um, to, to move those forwards. And they've been doing great stuff in, in, in different places, uh, as have obviously the local natural history societies. And we'll be working with those and much more to kind of push these, uh, the, every little helps is the mantra. Um, anything we can do to get, to get these things better. Um, and of course, there's a major challenge in terms of growing food. Uh, and this distinction between land sparing and land sharing, you know, so we need to grow food, of course. Um, and some farmers will do it by sparing land, wildflower margins, and some will be doing it by sharing, you know, with uh, less intensive form of farming. Um, whatever, the, whatever the mix, um, we can do that. 
uh, and obviously we'll be working uh, with a number of people to try and achieve that. And obviously, let's look for wilder wetlands. Um, you know, so who knows? I mean, on the basis that what we've seen just this year is uh, uh, white-tailed sea eagles um, in the landscape of Rutland. Um, obviously, they've come up from the reintroduction in the Isle of Wight, but who knows? Um, you know, we've got sea eagles across Scotland. Well, they're not just coastal birds. Um, it wouldn't be, you know, there's, there's some interesting research in Wales showing that actually they were in the, the inland landscapes. Well, you know, who knows whether or not they will be uh, in, the, they could easily be moving around the landscape. These birds move long distances. Um, so they could be just a natural part of the component of the landscape of Leicestershire and Rutland uh, in 20, 30, 40, um, uh, if not sooner. Um, again, so could the cranes, you know, let's, let's, let's look at creating wilder wetlands in the landscapes of the Soren Reek and the river valleys where the rivers are meandering and we've been doing great stuff at Narborough Bog um, and we'll be looking to, to do that elsewhere in terms of what we call natural flood management. Um, working with nature and the natural processes and river meanders um, and you know, kind of creating flood water storage areas. Um, and let's let's find ways of allowing water to stay on the fields, um, you know, where these natural ponds occur. So that what we've got is a greater connection between the river landscape and the farmed landscape and the river valleys being what river valleys really were. Um, you know, landscapes rich with uh, pike and otters and water voles um, and uh, giving nutrients to the soil and revitalizing the landscape. Uh, and, you know, kind of hopefully we can do much more of that too. Um, as I say, we've been working in great stuff with uh, the likes of the Environment Agency and the catchment partnerships um, to, to build on that. So there's really great stuff we can look forward to um, in, in the, 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 the wet and landscape. And all of these things obviously are corridors and, and stepping stones. Um, and and you know, the really important thing here is it's not just us that need to do this. We need to encourage others. Um, so, you know, who knows, we might see, uh, as I say, whether it's natural colonization, we can look forward to, um, you know, kind of pressures uh, from na natural colonization of maybe cranes and, and storks and beavers and, and all sorts of stuff. So it's really a question of how ambitious do we want to be um, and this is why the journey is really important you know we need to take people on this journey we need to remind people that um, we need to create this wilder landscape for our own benefit as well as for the benefit of these organisms and how are we going to do that well we're going to do that aren't we by um, creating these uh, th these corridors so, well no let's start on this on this landscape here actually let's start from the top left hand corner everything helps every little helps so you know we can all do things can't we in terms of letting gardens go messier um, you know not cutting the grass uh, everywhere uh, leaving leaving edges of gr rough grassland um, leaving areas with uh, <clears throat> where the, the hedgehogs in, in the urban areas can, can forage, leaving areas to go wild with nettles and brambles, the great little habitats that are important for uh, small tortoiseshells and red admirals and their caterpillars, uh, the caterpillars that feed the blue tits and the, and the wrens and the dunnocks and um, the, you know, the going up through the food chain. So this, every little helps, the more we can get that. And there's some really interesting stuff being done by the University of Leicester to look at uh, in, in an urban area, um, you know, kind of how, how prepared are people to create these little wilder gardens and how it's important as, to us. And one of the key, key things we'll be doing as a trust, as, as we are doing, is <clears throat> in that urban area, obviously, the, the projects in terms of uh, forest schools, but also educating people um, to, to create these kind of wildlife gardens. Um, and then we step step up a scale to, to these stepping stones. And, and obviously, you know, I, I mean, I just pick on golf courses had really, you know, we, we've had some really exciting discussions with, uh, with a number of golf courses to look at whether or not we can create a network uh, of, of golf courses, uh, a shared network of golf courses contributing to the biodiversity agenda. Think of those as fantastic stepping stones. Um, and of course, Leicestershire is in the top three, I think, 
for the provision of minerals, because if we're going to build houses uh, and things like that, we need to get the material from somewhere. Um, and, and we've got lots of gravel and we've got lots of fantastic rocks that, that, that we'll be needing to use. So we've got some fantastic opportunities here and let's get all of those quarries. Um, and we've been doing some fantastic work. Indeed, the, the, the in quarry industries, particularly aggregates industries, um, like at Barden, um, some fantastic work in terms of the restoration projects. Um, and, you know, let's, let's make sure that, that, that all of those other quarries um, you know, build on the, 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 the really cracking examples like our nature reserves at Ketten Quarry, uh, as an example, uh, and produce some really fantastic butterfly rich, scrubby rich, calcareous grasslands, acid grasslands. Um, and that's the sort of thing that, again, you know, we've been working closely with uh, as best we can. Um, there's still a lot to do, of course. Um, but we've made some great strides and, and we've got some great plans and some really great hopes and expectations for those other quarries that are coming on stream or will be uh, over the next decade or so. Um, that legacy for 2050, 2060, when those restoration projects really occur. Um, and I mentioned the sparing and sharing of farmland, of course. 80% of Leicestershire and Rutland is farmland. Um, and so we can't do it alone. And, and it's really, really important to work with that farming community. And every one, any one of us, you know, we can all obviously be going out and talking to the farmers and helping them um, and sharing with them and, and, and encouraging them to, to create a, a wilder, richer land, farming landscape. And I mentioned the corridor clubs and the roadside verges and the fantastic stuff that some, some people are doing uh, already. Um, these farmer clusters, these land state, land, landowner clusters, um, where already farmers are getting together. And I'll just touch on a few more examples of that in a wee while. Um, but that, you know, that, that this very journey about we're all in it together. Um, you know, and, and if only we had more people in the trust and we had more money to employ more people to, to go out and about. Um, and we don't um, uh, yet, um, but we obviously have loads and loads of members. You guys are members and local groups and, you know, it'll be fantastic if we can energize and help and encourage you guys. And if we can all work together, you know, to kind of encourage everybody to be part of this journey. Um, because one of my favorite uh, ambitions, I guess, favourite's possibly the wrong word, one of my key ambitions is to create not just more, bigger, better local uh, nature reserves for the Wildlife Trust, um, you know, extending them, working with our neighbours um, and getting the neighbours to, to turn their neighbouring land into uh, extensions of those nature reserves, but also creating a, a network of private nature reserves. They don't have to be connected with the Trust. Let's create a movement where people feel as though they're part of their own private nature and nature reserve network across Leicestershire and Rutland. And we all share in the enjoyment of, of the productivity of that. Um, knowing that, remember this target of 76,000 hectares, that if we add it all together, um, then that's 30% of Leicestershire and Rutland that's managed for wildlife and people, of course, you know, that wildlife is good for people and we can enjoy that. We can feel some really interesting research. Haven't we? I think we've all enjoyed that, haven't we? You know, throughout the sad times of the last six months that, you know, just take a moment and think back to what it was like in April and May when we could hear the bird song. We couldn't hear the planes, we couldn't hear the cars. And we could see the landscape for what it was. And maybe we can create that again, you know, because it brought, it brought joy to the soul, didn't it? And these are just the, you know, kind of just the simple things that we can do, you know, to create this wilder Leicestershire and Rutland. It's no mate, you know, it's not a challenge that's beyond us. We just need to kind of step by step in a jigsaw kind of way, looking at the different paths that we need to follow, we can do that. Um, and so there are some really important tools that, that are ahead of us now. We're on the cusp of a really, really exciting time now. I and mean, it's kind of like all the stars are aligned and it's up to us to make, the, make them to fit together and shine brightly greater than the sum of their parts. So we've got the agriculture bill coming through and paying farmers. And the key thing here is making sure that we find the way of paying farmers properly, effectively, um, you know, su sufficiently for stewardship and life and carbon and beetles and pollinators and birds and food um, and hedgerows. Um, and that we, we take advantage of something called net gain, um, where developments are required to provide 10% extra for biodiversity. 
um, as, a, as a legal requirement. And that's a fantastic opportunity that lies ahead of us. Um, and obviously we've got this tree strategy, there's this demand to plant trees and, you know, we need to do that, and, but we need to make sure the trees are in the right place. And not only that, we need to make sure that we allow trees to grow naturally. Natural regeneration is a much better way of, uh, of getting trees to grow and store carbon in the soil uh, for a whole raft of reasons. Uh, it takes time, of course, but it's uh, you know, letting nature do what nature does best is the, is the really important mantra there. So let's look forward to the bottom right there is creating a nature recovery network. That's also a requirement of the Environment Act, which is the middle picture. It's the, the 25 year plan um, of link, you know, kind of linking habitats and creating stepping stones, that, that kind of matrix, if you like, uh, as well. And um, yesterday's meeting of, of, of global governments was actually aimed at uh, preparations for this post 2020 biodiversity framework. So governments will be getting together in Kunming next year to commit to, 30, to protecting 30% of the world. Um, that's a commitment that they're already making. And it'll be really important to see, you know, kind of what comes out of that um, and, uh, and how we can deliver that at a local level, as well as, uh, you know, kind of setting our own, um, uh, our own local targets as part of the global picture. But actually, I want us to be much more ambitious. 2030 is just a platform. 2030 is something we really need to be ambitious about. OK, and I hope I've given you the idea that it's a big target, but it's something that's easily achievable if we really, really and we can we can make this happen. But there was some really important stuff came out just a couple of days ago. You know, maybe you'll have seen in The Guardian and it's still there. This really interesting press release. Planetary safety net could halt wildlife loss and slow climate breakdown. Um, and this really exciting research that shows that if actually we protect 50 percent, um, of the planet, then um, actually that's a future for wildlife and us. Um, I know it's a sketchy map in the middle in terms of the, the areas they suggested for Britain. You can see that they're actually mainly areas of outstanding natural beauty in national parks and really carbon rich landscapes. Um, but nonetheless, that gives you a sense of scale of what Britain needs to look like in terms of being 50%. Um, and, and let's be a part of that. Um, so 30 by 30, 40 by 40, let's go for 50 by 50. And on the right hand side there, you can see that there's a, there's a global movement afoot called Half Earth. The god of biodiversity, E.O. Wilson, Edward Wilson, um, who almost coined the term biodiversity, uh, he started this move called uh, Half Earth, um, recognizing that we probably need um, to save half of the earth because that saves potentially kind of it's it reduces the risk for three quarters of, of species um, and that's that has to be our ambition um, this longer term gain you know I'm sure we can do it in in some way shape or form if we just add up the all of the pictures so 70,000 75,000 hectares what do you think that comes out at 50 percent around 100,000 let's go for 100,000 hectares shall we because that's what we could be aiming for. Some really, just very quickly, just some things that can help us look at that. Um, some websites you might want to look at. Um, there's a really fantastic project called Rewilding Britain. Um, and uh, that's kind of meant to pull together all of these projects and really energize this whole process of rewilding or wilding. Um, there's a really interesting, exciting project called Wild East. You can see there, I don't know whether you've already picked up on the top right hand corner. Um, it's based in East Anglia. Um, and look at the animal that they've created as a picture, as a suggestion of what might be reintroduced to East Anglia. Uh, I leave that um, as, a, as a taster, because of course that species might well start to recolonize, to colonize Leicestershire and Rutland if they do indeed enable a reintroduction in, in, into uh, Norfolk and Suffolk. Um, and the top right hand corner actually, uh, Wild Ken Hill, uh, I don't know how many of you know, but Lloyd Park is leaving us, has left us actually now, um, to, to become conservation manager or project officer, I can't remember the exact title, at Wild Ken Hill on the North Norfolk coast. Again, one of my old hunting grounds, um, just south of Hunstanton and Heacham, uh, just north of Snettisham Nature Reserve, where they're going to turn a thousand acres into a wilderness. And they've already got beavers there, uh, which they're hoping to, to actually release from their pen into the wild. 
and that's part of the Wild East movement. Um, and then a really exciting project, which is uh, which is Leicestershire based, which has just been set up, um, called uh, Let's uh, Let's Rewild, um, and they're looking to to enable people to save wildlife through crowdfunding. So a couple of webs, four websites there. If you kind of you know, if we work together and and help and encourage people to to get part, join in these sorts of projects, then we can take people on that journey, can't we? Um, and we can ex we can excite and innovate and innovate and energize people for what could be a really really exciting future. Um, I'm, you know, some of you have probably read some of these books, but again, I would encourage you, you know, as Christmas presents, if you've got friends who are interested, but edgy, not quite sure, a little bit of word, a little bit wah, you know, um, give them one of these books, give them Isabella Tree's book, uh, Rewilding, bottom left hand corner, there is a really, really exciting book, just setting the bigger picture. My favourite book is actually Rewording, well, two of them, I suppose, Rebirding um, by Benedict MacDonald is a fantastic book. Um, rambunctious garden again really challenges people to think about rewilding um, and wilderness not just rewilding but wilderness rewilding us as people um, you know getting rid of all of the the kind of the strictures and the constraints that we seem to surround ourselves with currently um, and if we want to be more scientific then um, there's a an ecological reviews called rewilding looking at all the, the, the kind of the ecology and the science and that's a cracking book um, and possibly also uh, species conservation in management managed habitats, which actually fundamentally is a, a really fantastic guide to how we might achieve this. Um, because we can do it scientifically, um, I was involved in the reintroduction of large blue and that was based on science. Um, and it's amazing how the large blue butterflies have responded to not just letting go, but actually also letting go in a scientific way. Um, and, uh, you know, the large blues are no longer a threat of extinction. But anyway, I hope that's given you an idea of the fact that we can do this. Um, you know, we as a trust are committed uh, to, doing, to doing great stuff for wildlife over the next 10 years. 20, 30, we're going through a strategy refresh at the moment. We'll be setting some what we call stretch goals, um, trying to be ambitious, uh, trying to set ourselves, recognizing you know, that we can only do so much, um, that we are limited, uh, we're a small organization, is to punch a bigger punch, um, greater than the sum of our weight, you know, as staff, as members, as volunteers, as low groups working in partnership with everybody um, in order to achieve this 30% by 2030 and encourage everybody to go for 40 by 40 and 50 by 50. So uh, there we go. I hope that's given you a whistle stop tour of uh, you know, kind of my perspective, um, the perspective I know that many of and all of the staff uh, of the trust have, you know, in terms of being ambitious, uh, in terms of making sure that uh, now is the time that we've got to turn that corner. Uh, you know, enough is enough. It's time for wildlife to have a place in the wider countryside. Thank you. Thank you, John. Okay, we've got a few questions coming in. Um, so I'll just go through. Um, so the first one we have is, does, um, L, does LRWT have the status to challenge district councils who will have to approve housing developments to ask the builders for wild places? The builders often fund schools and leisure facilities with Section 106 funds. <laughs> okay, yes, uh, interesting question. Um, <clears throat> status is an interesting word, but uh, I'll, I'll answer that in two different ways, if I may. Uh, I think we I think we do um, in some respects. Uh, I think we we certainly we have a great working relationship with with many of the district councils and the county councils, uh, especially through the ecologists that many of them have. And one of the great shames is that we don't have you know kind of a full ecological um, supply within those district councils. Um, but where we can, we've persuaded them to make differences. Sometimes it doesn't happen, of course, they've got different agendas. But the fact of the matter is that they have a biodiversity duty um, and they can't, they can't avoid that. Um, and they, there will be pressures and the public can obviously put pressure on them to, uh, to recognise that they've got a biodiversity duty under what's called the, the NERC Act 2006. Um, and 
uh, and net gain is a tool that they have to have and the developers will need to to abide by the net gain the biodiversity net gain 10 percent delivery um, so even where we don't have the status i think we can we can deliver um, wilder places through the, the housing developments and i think the public will be demanding that anyway okay thank you um okay we've got a question from fred <clears throat> uh the trouble is um he's saying um the trouble is leicestershire county council seem to want to manicure the grass verges and this year the hedges have had the same not leaving any food for winter for birds it's more of a statement than a question mm. okay <laughs> yeah but I'm, I'm happy to take that and and fred it's some it's one of the really really important things is obviously that what we we need to have people out there who are you know kind of being the guardians the eyes and the ears and the defenders of wildlife um and and you might have noticed just um last week i think it was there was, or was it earlier this week there was uh um a little bit on the bbc website uh looking at a project called blue hearts uh where the county council actually is working with a, the Blue Hearts project to, uh, to, to find ways of managing, allowing verges to become more pollinator friendly. Um, and, and I know that uh, I'm working closely, we're working closely with Lucy Hoylmer as the Environment Partnerships Manager. And indeed we're doing this with Rutland County Council too, because they've been doing great stuff in terms of managing verges. Well, no, not necessarily managing verges, but allowing verges to become more wildlife friendly. We've got to be careful, of course, about, you know, kind of safety issues. But um, I think the message is getting through that uh, it's cost effective not to manicure the grass verges. Uh, the bit about hedgerows, um, yeah, I mean, it's challenging, isn't it? You, again, you've got safety measures um, and it's not just the county council. Um, you know, there are also landowners who do that. Um, and again, I think that the messages are getting through and it's, it's a constant process of just simply persuading people that they don't need to do that. Uh, and I, th I think we, 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 we're kind of managing to get some of the messages through. So I, I, think, I think the tide is in the right direction there. Okay. Um, okay, Corey is asking, how can you be so confident of the future and that our leaders will actually put their words into action? In 1992, they agreed to the Rio conventions, none of which have been delivered. Um, and the same with Copenhagen and Paris. How can we, how can the future be so different this time? <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'm a, I, I know, I'm, I'm an eternal optimist every day I wake up and thinking, think today is going to be a better day than it was yesterday. And I don't mean that, I mean that in a good way, not a bad way. Um, and, and, and yes, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's great that we've also got people like George Monbiot at one, at one end of the spectrum. And I hope you kind of look at what he writes in The Guardian. And actually, I'm, I'm even more confident now because we've got people like Greta Thunberg Berg, uh, Maya Rose Craig, you know, young conservationists, Chris Packham, who's a middle-aged conservationist, but people who are prepared to say what they really think, you know, and hold people to account. Um, and I think the more we have people power in a democratic kind of way, you know, actually saying now, you know, we haven't got time now. Uh, I, you know, as an academic, ex-academic and a scientist, we've actually only really got 10 years to make a difference. Um, and I think people, you know, for you know, for all the, the kind of weasel words and the backs, you know, and, and the kind of ways in which they get around it, I, I think people are beginning to realise that actually we don't, we can't mess with the planet any longer, um, you know, and so that's where my optimism lies as much as anything. Yep. Okay. Um, okay, Tim is asking, uh, great interventions, messy gardens, urban wild spots, field margins, road verges, golf course areas, but does this really add up to 30%? We know we can make fantastic improvements, but is it realistically on the right scale? Um, adding all that up together, I've got no idea, frankly, but that's one of the, but that's a really important point, Tim, and it's one of the things that we're going to be doing. So as part of the Environment Act, um, we will need to create something called a local nature recovery strategy. And I've been working uh, with a, a number of partners over the last six months or so to create that movement. Um, and uh, because it will be a legal requirement to have a local nature recovery strategy. Um, the government is committed to this 30 by 30. Um, now, that's a national level perspective, not a local level one. Um, so there's obviously a balance to strike there. But again, 
you know uh, if if we can if we can work with the the invite the agriculture bill to encourage farmers you know every little helps across the farming landscape 80 percent of the landscape is farming so you know if we can just get five or ten percent of every farm you know then that's that's eight percent which we can add to the other eight percent which makes 16 percent and then you add another eight percent from the urban areas and then that gets to 20 percent and so on and so on and so on so we just need to put the the the, uh, the numbers into the calculator um, and i think we can we can get there yes okay um what introductions might be made in Leicestershire and Rutland following the successful water vole introductions at Rutland Water? Mm, good question. And obviously this is a tricky one, isn't it? Because um, as I say, one of the key things is not to scare the natives with the idea of reintroducing wolves and bears and lynx and, you know, who knows where we'll stop. Um, much as I'd really like to be excited by wandering through the landscape and seeing, you know, kind of these big megafauna uh, kicking around, who knows, red deer in the middle of Leicestershire when you're kind of going shopping and stuff like that, um, as they saw in Germany um, over the last six months. Um, Let's start small, for example, you know, let's start thinking about whether or not um, we can uh, reintroduce some some of the beetles that we're missing. I'm not, not actually a great advocate of reintroductions. I'd much rather create the habitats for species to, to, to come back in. Um, but yeah, who knows? Um, you know, we, we could easily start to, to look at beavers. Um, we could easily start to look at uh, pine martins, uh, dormice. Um, you know, uh, it's kind of scary things, isn't it? You know, adders, and there are some around, maybe we need to move those around. Um, you know, the, the, the world is our oyster in some respects. I know that doesn't answer the question. <laughs> okay, Steve is asking, to achieve the 30%, what type of land will the trust target to make the biggest impact? Right, good question. And um, it actually really depends on, on the different landscapes. So we've got a map called the Living Landscapes map and recognising that different habitats, you know, Leicestershire and Rutland has different habitats across the landscape. So we'll definitely want to be, uh, you know, kind of focusing on things like the calcareous grasslands, which are really, really under threat on, in, in the east because it's a limited habitat. That has to be a priority habitat. Um, we'll clearly be, be looking at uh, uh, woodlands because the, the landscape is a, a, the woodland landscape is typical, uh, particularly of the northwest and the southwest. Um, and um, one, one of my, I suppose, favorite missing habitats is heathland. You know, kind of just looking at the, uh, the you know, kind of northwest landscape. Uh, okay, so heathland, you could argue, is a man-made landscape, a man-made construct, but it, it actually, it must have natural analogues. Um, so uh, if you just kind of look at historic maps, and I'm not advocating we go back, you know, in time, but there's a clearly an indication that, you know, kind of heathlands were part of the natural landscape. So, that, that, you know, we're, we're bound to want to look at that, that sort of landscape too. Uh, bare patches, rocky patches. Um, you know, actually, in all of this, I'm not so worried about habitats, I'm more worried about natural processes. Um, so what I want to reintroduce uh, are the natural processes of grazing, uh, of wind blow, of uh, creating blank open spaces where species which are colonizers, because what we're really missing from this landscape is an ecological process. We're missing spaces for the colonizers to colonize and move from patch to patch of bare earth, um, you know, because they, they simply can't can't do that anymore. Okay, one from um, Tom, who's asking, how will rewilding, rewilding contribute to combating climate change? Right, good question. Um, and the important thing here, um, in many respects, is this aspect of two things. One is obviously the urgency in terms of climate change, and, and we've got an urgency there uh, in terms of our carbon emissions. Uh, and I know I'm not answering this directly, but in terms of climate change, we must not underestimate the importance of us as human beings reducing our footprint. We can't let nature uh, address the, the fact that we are contributing to climate change. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is <clears throat> rewilding makes a major contribution through this point about natural processes and carbon sequestration. The natural process of bio, biomass accumulation through photosynthesis, uh, enabling not just trees, 
but vegetation to grow. That vegetation stores uh, its carbon, not just above ground, but below ground um, through mycorrhizal associations. Uh, and so if we, if we enable um, uh, bio carboniferous organisms, particularly plants to grow, um, and all the biomass that goes with it, all the natural birds and plants, sorry, birds and insects and mammals that live in these areas, um, which ideally we'd, we'd allow to die within that landscape too and not remove them, um, then that carbon gets locked up in the soil and it becomes part of a carbon cycle. Uh, and that, that is a carbon cycle which doesn't include, doesn't necessarily include an increase in carbon dioxide. So rewilding is critical to this process of combating climate change by locking away, um, you know, by enabling it to take advantage of that excess carbon dioxide uh, and accelerating the, 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 the locking up and sequestering uh, within biomass. And I know that's a very ecological answer and I'm not patronizing. Great. Um, okay. Um, okay, sorry. Okay, um, Gordon is asking, we talk about reintrodu reintroductions of species. Yeah. What does the trust think about getting rid of problem species that should not be here, for example, mink? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, whilst I can't remember the details, Gordon, I'm very sorry, uh, the Wildlife Trust movement does have a, a, a policy uh, on, uh, on um, what you might call problem species. Um, <clears throat> and of course, it's really important that we, we take an appropriate approach to species which are uh, inappropriate within the landscape. Um, now, you know, we need to do some of that at a micro scale. Um, so there are elements of control that we have to put in place. Uh, so, for example, controlling deer at Rutland Water, the landscape around there uh, within woodlands, you know, that sort of thing, um, because there are micro problems. Um, and indeed, you know, th there's an aspect here about, um, you know, we don't necessarily ab absolutely advocate culling mink. Um, <clears throat> but we have to recognize that one of the things we've got to do is to change the countryside in such a way as some of those species no longer find a space for them to exist within it. Okay, so there are natural ways of, of preventing species from having a place in the future. Uh, some of these species, unfortunately, ha are already here to stay. Uh, there's nothing much that we can do with it. Um, but um, as another example, Himalayan balsam, um, you know, we, what we've got to do with Himalayan balsam is start at the top of the catchment and remove it, move, remove it from the top of the catchment and then clear it bit by bit. OK, so um, there are, you know, there are some approaches that we uh, that we can take. Yeah. OK, we've still got a few questions, but we're, we're running out of time. So we'll just um, we'll do one more. Um, so Kate is asking. Um, Although some farmers are sympathetic to providing areas for wildlife on their land, others continue to cut back hedgerows and field margins to maximize land for crops. How can these farmers be approached to try to convince them of the value of leaving areas to go wild for the benefits of more natural farming? Okay, yeah, um, <clears throat> well, uh, we're always going to have, uh, have challenges, aren't we? And uh, I think one, one of the ways in which we can do that, obviously, is, uh, is encouraging the farmers who are doing the great stuff to encourage those who aren't uh, to make change, you know, to, to help them understand the benefits of doing that. You know, so the more we can get those stories out about, um, you know, the successes uh, from a wildlife and an economic perspective, you know, because let's, let's, let's not uh, beat around the bush here. Um, you know, farmers are growing food for the nation. Um, they also need to make a living out of it. Uh, they need to put food on their table. Um, and the more we can find farmers who are managing to make a living out of being friendly for wildlife and producing food, the more we can use those as champions within the industry. Um, you know, we don't have to go into it cold. Um, and, uh, and obviously there's also a place for, for people who are going to chain themselves to hedgerows or bulldozers, you know, and make a stand. Um, but I think uh, the more we can be persuasive uh, in a positive way, 
uh, the more we can make a change. Uh, and obviously, it's there's something called Einstein's ladder of participation, which is just simply moving people one step along the way. And you know, the more we can, using every little helps, the more we can help them make a difference, a little step along the way to rewild their farms, uh, the better. Yeah. Okay. So unfortunately, we've there's a few questions. Um, there's sort of five or six more questions. We're not going to have time to go through them all. Um, so if you have a submitted a question and we haven't had time to answer it, um, I'm sure John would be happy if you wanted to email them into us and he can um, <laughs> pop you a reply. Um, so. Um, Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, thank you, John, for a great talk. Um, I will let um, Bruce sort of wrap up the evening for us. Um, but I'll just pop, I'll just say that if you would like to find any more information out about our wonderful local groups who have organized this program of talks, um, or you'd like to find out any more about any more talks that we have coming up over the next couple of months, um, please go to our website, it's just lrwt.org.uk um, and there's, all the information is on there. Um, I would just also like to add that John, along with all the other speakers of our programme of talks, are all talking for free. Um, so if you would like to give a donation, um, you can also do that on our website. Um, so thank you very much and Bruce, I'll let you <laughs> wrap it up for us. Okay, thank you, Harriet. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, John, for a most interesting talk. And you've left us with um, plenty of food for thought, I think. It'll be interesting to see um, in 2030 what sort of progress we've made. Uh, might not, I might not be around in 2050 to see, uh, see how we go then, but uh, hopefully by 2030. So on behalf of everybody who's tuned in, thanks very much, John. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed it. And uh, good luck, everybody. Let's make a wilder future together. Yes, thank you very much.